Yeah, well, you might recognize this spot, Logan. This is the same spot that was just packed after Title 42. You remember in between the fences over here? Well, the humanitarian mission is not over by any means. There was a slow period in between May and, well, about three weeks ago. But things really, really picked up. And these are some of the things that volunteers have brought by. You know, they either see it on television or they see it on one of the social media. And they come. In, in fact, one person brought all this water here that you're looking at. You're going to hear from him coming up in just a minute but he said he saw something on tv last week and said it touched his heart and he had to come out here and do something interesting though because when we got here this morning this camp had a lot of people at it well the border patrol just showed up in a couple of buses and all those people are currently gone take a look not since the end of Title 42 have we seen so many people from so many countries waiting for asylum at the San Diego border. So this is our 16th day um, of um, trying to help and do what we can to lend support to the people waiting. Uh, to have contact with the agency. This, by the way, is the same open space where thousands of people were camped out for two weeks after Title 42 expired way back in May. Clearly, this is the largest surge since then. Well, we are in a situation that is unprecedented, and we that's why we're helping here. That's why we are. We have volunteers who, from their, you know, time, free time, and and their hearts, they've been able to provide food, water. How's it going? Can I Good. Help you? It's times like these when the heart and soul of a community is tested. In this community, we usually pass the compassion test. I've got a car load here. I, I now know that a Tesla can hold 50 cases of water, so I'm ready to go back to the store. We're going to buy 50 more. This is just human to human. These are hungry people. These are cold people. These are people looking for protection from the sun. And, you know, how fortunate are we that, you know, America's provided us a lot of opportunities and uh, just trying to pay it forward and see if we can help help a few, fellow human out. As of this afternoon, this makeshift camp has been cut in half. All the other people have been taken away on this bus to be processed and then released. All the shelters, private and public, are currently overwhelmed. This is where we see uh, street releases, yes, a specific in San Isidro, some in El Cajon, some in Oceanside. Uh, people will get there and people will find a way to uh, have a family member buy a ticket for them. Uh, in some cases, some of the uh, humanitarian organizations are helping to uh, to get them to their final destination. For those left behind, it's just a matter of time. These are the people trying to enter America through the proper channels and will soon be on a bus with a promise to appear. We heard from uh, Border Patrol that they hope to clear everyone tonight, by, by today, by the end of today. We are hoping to, uh, that is the case, uh, you know, for the safety and, and, and comfort, especially of children and moms waiting with children. So we are hoping that by uh, hopefully by tonight, uh, people will be cleared out from that space. All righty, we are back out here live, and uh, as you can see, the pantry is full. And as you pan over, you can see some of the volunteers over here. There's a variety of volunteer groups uh, that have been helping out out here. But interesting, all the uh, migrants just took off, and before they took off, each one of them picked up a garbage bag and cleaned up the area on the other side of the fence. So there is absolutely nobody here right now. There were about 100 people here earlier, and previously, over the past couple of weeks, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people that have come through this area and again as you just heard in that story many of them are just given a notice to appear on a bus ticket and they're dropped off at some kind of transit station and then they try to make their way to wherever they are going so it appears as if whatever rush was happening over the past couple of weeks uh, that rush is currently over right now but I just talked to these folks behind me and they said that any given time in the next 10 minutes the next hours three o'clock in the morning it doesn't matter there could be many many more groups of people that are coming over here and keep in mind these are the people that are putting their hands up and saying I want to claim asylum these are not the people who are trying to sneak over the fence and sneak into America without going through the proper paperwork so these are the folks trying to do it right and I know that there's a lot of people in our community that are trying to help them survive this journey can you even imagine some of the journeys these people have taken over the past couple of weeks and months and years you saw those trains full of people, people hanging off on the edge just for a chance to get to America. Unbelievable what they go through to get here. And once they get here, of course, they have a lot of good people who are feeding them and helping them with water. But aside from that, we're not quite sure where they're going from here. They're dropped off at transit stations. All right, you guys. Uh, we will throw it.
back to you, and we'll see you back here in just a little bit, all right? Yeah, Dan, making those uh, huge journeys, just oftentimes with just a backpack, the clothes on their back, not knowing the language, and, and just probably very scared about everything. Uh, and then it takes, of course, several mm. years before they can even get in front of a judge. All right, Dan, plan for us. Dan, thank you. Oh, yeah. And as migrant crossings continue to rise, Customs and Border Protecting reporting a new record of 2.2 million migrant encounters this fiscal year. VP of Border Patrol Council Art Del Cueto joins us now to talk more about these new numbers. Art, good evening. Um, tell me, first of all, your reaction as you've been hearing, everybody's been hearing about the numbers, those individuals at the borders. What are you guys seeing? Well, I mean, make no mistake about it that the correct way to do it is to go to the, uh, you know, U.S. consulate and ask for their immigration documents there and claim asylum through there or through the port of entry. And individuals are not doing that. They're going in between the ports like you have been seeing. And the reason for that is because the drug cartels are the ones that control where groups are going. They know strategically where to send the groups. And they realize that by sending them in between the ports of entry, it'll distract law enforcement officials. It'll distract border patrol agents. It'll force them in those areas where now they're going to have to do the transporting. And obviously, you know, they're going to do some of the processing and many times hospital watches. All that time is, is time away from the actual line. And it gives the opportunity for the drug cartels to bring drugs into the United States. And we're seeing that across the entire uh, so southern border. Talk about your resources, obviously, with the amount, the number that are coming here to our border. That's got to put a strain on all of the Border Patrol, right? You know, it's, it's putting a strain on the Border Patrol, but, you know, more importantly, it's putting a strain on the entire, you know, American public because people are realizing that, you know, a lot of resources, medical resources near the uh, um, border, medical resources throughout the country, a lot of that, you know, is, is being bombarded by a lot of these individuals. So it's putting a strain on the entire country. Obviously, it puts a humongous strain uh, on the men and women that are out there putting their lives on the line. And, and it's very frustrating, uh, especially when uh, everyone that, that's involved realizes that this could end if the current administration had the political will to send immigration judges and asylum officers to those areas and put a stop to this. But instead, they've chosen to ignore it, and that's why we continue to see this. There's no consequences for their, the actions of uh, what is taking place on the southern border. You said lives on the line. Talk about, um, you know, it is a dangerous profession in some, in some instances as well. What has safety been like for you guys? So as, as, as we've talked about, you know, when you have so many agents and so many individuals that are, you know, in processing or administrative roles, it does lessen the amount of uh, individuals that are out on the line that could provide backup in many instances. And, you know, you're, you're seeing it throughout the entire, you know, border, not just the southwest border, to be honest. It's been it's happening on the northern border. The numbers have gone up on the northern border as well. And, and it's all based on, you know, individuals realize, hey, there's no consequence. And, and as I said, and, and DHS has reported it, right? DHS himself said, that they were detained and arrested individuals from 168 different countries. So you see a big movement of individuals from Venezuela and areas of Texas. You're seeing down in El Paso a big amount of individuals from Haiti and from Cuba that come across. In Arizona, particularly, you're seeing a lot of individuals from Northeast Africa, from Serbia, and from Egypt. So it's really people from all over the world that are coming across right now because the word is out. All you have to do is claim asylum and you'll get released in the United States. Art Del Cueto, thank you so much for joining us and providing your insight. We appreciate it. Thank you.